Hello, everyone. I'm here today with Nancy Harhut, and getting people to take action is what Nancy's all about. Her specialty is blending best-of-breed creative with decision science to prompt response. A frequent speaker at industry conferences, Nancy shared her passion with audiences from Mount Moscow as the only American on the speaker's roster to the U.S. Department of Defense two times. Along the way, she's been named NEDMA Direct Marketer of the Year, Ad Club Top 100 Creative Influencer, OMI Top 40 Digital Marketing Strategist, and Andy Emerson Award recipient. Prior to, to the Wild Agency, Nancy held senior creative manager positions with Hill Holiday, Mullen, and Digitus. She and her teams have won over 150 awards for digital and direct marketing effectiveness. And today, we are going to talk about the psychological aspects of email marketing. Nancy, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Dave. How about yourself? I am doing awesome. And as I just told you, <clears throat> I um, was looking over what we're going to be talking about again, and there are so many questions I want answered <laughs> about uh, email marketing and, and trying to use it to the best of its abilities. And uh, I don't think there's a better person to talk to in the country about the psychological aspects of it. Uh, I've seen you speak a couple times, and I just absolutely have loved your information. So super excited to talk with you today. Well, thank you. All right. So to uh, just dig right in here, uh, but before we get into pointers to help out with email marketing, um, I'd like to just have you quickly give your take on the importance and power of email marketing in general. Sure. So these days, it's really become the, the marketer's workhorse. I think that email is really kind of the, the primary channel that, that the majority of marketers rely on. In fact, um, MailerGen did a survey, and they found that 89% of marketers say that email is their primary channel for lead generation. The DMA, the Direct Marketing Association, says that it delivers a 4,300% ROI. McKinsey and Company said it's 40 times more effective than Facebook and Twitter when it comes to generating customers. And there was a recent study that was reported in Search Engine Journal, and they found that people who buy products marketed to them via email spend 138% more than people outside of the email marketing campaign. So clearly email is important, and clearly it's powerful. Wow. Wow, I knew it was. But, um, wow, those are some very strong numbers. I will tell you, just as another marketer, I love email. Absolutely love it. Um, you know, I don't do it instead of everything else, obviously, but, you know, in conjunction, but I, I always speak to the power. It almost is like old school marketing. It almost feels like this these days, but it's super powerful. Okay, you sold me um, 100% if I wasn't already sold on utilizing email. But now, why should marketers or email marketers consider the psychology when developing their email strategy? I have heard utilizing psychology as an email marketer's best kept secret. Is that true? And can you expound on that a bit? So, yeah, it, I mean, I, I think of it that way. I, I do think of it as, as a best-kept secret, and I definitely think that email marketers should consider psychology, although, you know, to your point, email is very important, and it's particularly important when used in integration, um, you know, in, in integrated campaigns. And, and, frankly, some of the things that we'll, we'll uh, probably talk about today are techniques that are ideal for email but that could also bleed over into other communications like uh, your direct mail or your social or your, your print or broadcast. Um, but we'll, we'll speak specifically about them for, for email, but keep that in mind. Um, but, but the reason that, that the psychological principles are so helpful and so important to marketers, particularly email marketers, is because of the competition that we have out there. Uh, any marketer is really you know, fighting to capture attention and then to capture response. And there's just a lot of competition out there. There are several studies that say that the average person gets about 85 emails a day. And if you bump that up to, to the busy executives, if you cross over from B to C to like B to B, that number climbs to about 200 emails per day, according to Harvard Business Review. So the bottom line is we in email marketing have a ton of competition. And people are really not spending a lot of time with us. They give us maybe three or four seconds when they decide whether or not to open an email and they're also very, very quick to delete, when, when, even when they do open an email. So here's where it gets interesting, though. These decisions to open or not open, to read or not read, to click or not click, to delete or not delete, a lot of these decisions are happening subconsciously. There's a, a gentleman named Gerald Zaltman. He's a Harvard Business School professor, and he's the author of How Customers Think. And he says that up to 95% of decision-making takes place in the subconscious mind. And this is really very interesting. Apparently what has happened is people over the millennia 
have developed certain decision-making shortcuts, certain automatic, instinctive, reflexive behaviors. And we've developed them over the millennia as a way to conserve mental energy because it's, it's really hard to weigh every bit of information before making a decision. We just never get around to making any. So we've developed these decision defaults, and we kind of cruise along on autopilot, and when we encounter a certain situation or what a researcher would call a stimulus, we just default to this automatic behavior without giving it a lot of thought. It's almost like, David, if you think about it, if I were to sneeze right now, you would probably quickly reply, bless you, or, or gesundheit. You probably wouldn't stop and, and really analyze it and go, oh, Nancy just sneezed. Should I or should I not say something? Hmm, what would be an appropriate thing to say? It, it would be a very automatic response. And it turns out that we as human beings have hundreds and hundreds of these automatic responses, and some of them govern the behaviors we have around email marketing. And that's why it's so important for marketers to factor in some of this uh, marketing psychology and some of these um, uh, you know, human behavior triggers when it comes to the email marketing because we can literally um, nudge people in the direction that we want them to go. And if we know that they're more likely to do a certain thing if they encounter a particular stimulus, let's make sure they encounter that particular stimulus. Mm -hmm. It just makes so much sense. And I'm a nerd when it comes to that stuff, too. I, I'm fascinated with it. It's just, it's, it's incredible. And then you start, one thing you start to learn is that you're not so special, <laughs> you know, you, you know, especially with all the psychogeometric stuff, I think they break down personalities into four or five types, right? And there's what, billions and billions and billions of people. So you start to realize that. And then once you kind of own that and you realize you're, you're not so unique, um, that's when this stuff, that's why you're able to be able to do that. Uh, and that's, so if you, if you didn't tell people already on, on utilizing email and the psychology, I think you just did. Um, so let's start at the top, uh, subject lines, you know, uh, and, and I know there's different pieces of you want to talk about that play a role in here, but let, let's go ahead and start at the top and work our way down. So subject lines, would love your advice on the best practices with these. Sure, sure. So, um, I think I've probably got three best practices. I can boil down my advice to, to three things. The first piece of advice is um, keep them short. In fact, I recommend about 35 characters, give or take. And the reason for this is over half of email opens are occurring on a mobile device these days. So you've just got that much less real estate to display your message and to avoid, you know, having your message cut off or to avoid saying something that you didn't really you know, mean to say because it got cut off, you're best trying to stay within about 35 characters and to actually front load the most important words at the beginning of those, uh, th those 35 characters. So that's my first piece of advice. Keep your subject line short. The second piece of advice, what you want to do is combine your subject line with a really powerful pre-header to create that one-two punch where you can actually amplify or extend your subject line, which is helpful since I'm saying keep the subject line within 35 characters. But that pre-header is that little snippet of, of text that you can actually see just under the subject line. And about, um, I don't know, I think like 87% of, of pre-headers actually do get displayed. So it, it really can be very, very powerful. So use that subject line and that pre-header as a powerful one-two punch. And then my third bit of advice or my third best practice is use iMagnet words. Now, at this point, you might say to me, well, what's an iMagnet word? And iMagnet words are simply words that are uh, scientifically proven to reach out and attract the human eye. Because when we write, we write in a very linear fashion, one word followed by the next, followed by the next. But when we read, we skim and we scan. And certain words have the power to kind of jump out and, and pull our eye in and get us to consume, consume I should say, consume the, uh, the rest of the message. And so those iMagnet words are particularly valuable in subject lines. So, for example, the word new. Copy blogger says new is one of the top five persuasive words, and I, um, I absolutely believe that. In fact, it's not just new, it's the whole family of new words, new, now, introducing, announcing, finally, soon. And the reason for this, the psychology for this, is that the brain craves things that are new and novel. We're constantly on the lookout for something new or novel because when we find it, it activates our brain's pleasure center. And as you might imagine, that feels good. So new is a great word to use in a subject line. Um, free is another eye magnet word. You can get a 10% lift in opens according to Sidekick. And what's interesting about the word free is uh, free will get you twice the open rate of complimentary according to world data. And the mm. psychology behind this, yeah, isn't that interesting? You think, ah, oh, you know. It's so interesting. Uh, complimentary seems like a better word, but go ahead, yeah. Well, go yeah, ahead. It sounds, you know, maybe a little classier, you know. Yeah. And, and you, you, know, you think like, oh, you know, it's just More personal, it gives a different almost, spin yeah. to it. But, uh, yeah, World Data did a study, and they found that free will get you twice the open rate of, of complimentary. And they also found, and, and this is worth mentioning, Dave, you know, there was a time 
a few years back when you would avoid free because it would actually uh, uh, trigger the spam filters, and you didn't want that. But for the last two or three years now, free has been one of the top performing subject line words because it's not um, it's not signaling spam anymore. The the um, the way that spam is evaluated has gotten much more sophisticated. It has to do with sender reputation and all kinds of algorithms that I'm not qualified to speak about. But what I can say is uh, free has become a top performing subject line word the last couple of years. And, and the psychology behind it comes to us courtesy of Dan Ariely, who's a um, behavioral economist and the author of the New York Times bestseller, Predictably Irrational. And he explains that free gives people such an emotional charge that we place far greater value on a free item than we really should. When we see something is free, we just want it in a way that we wouldn't if we had to actually pay for it. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think the third the third example I can give you for an eye mag magnet word is actually somebody's name because personalization can be very very important in uh, in subject lines. Our names are very dear to us. In fact, our brains actually light up when we see or hear our names. Um, and studies have been have been uh, conducted that show that we'll we'll trust a message more if our name is attached to it. So anytime you can put somebody's name in the subject line, that's going to go a long way to. Um, getting someone to notice it and, and open that email. In fact, Experian ran a test, and they found you can get a 29.3% lift in opening rates simply by putting somebody's, uh, but the, not somebody's, but the recipient's name in the subject line. So those are three examples of iMagnet words, and you start to use these things in combination, the shorter subject lines, a good one-two punch with a pre-header, and some of these iMagnet words, and you're on your way to having a really strong subject line. Okay, a couple follow-ups on that. Um, first off, um, I, I magnet words. Could could somebody you know get a full list from you by just typing in Nancy Harhut? Um, I magnet words, and 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 they'll find on Google how to get you know if you have you written a blog or something about that that we I can did, access. I've... I have written about uh, about I magnet words and and uh, spoken about them in a few different. Uh, places. So I think if someone were to Google that, they would be able to uh, to find it. Okay. And if not, they're absolutely welcome to uh, to email me or to contact me uh, via Twitter, and I'd be happy to uh, supply a longer list. Okay, very cool. And then um, another follow-up on that is, uh, you know, you mentioned the name, you mentioned the uh, iMagnet words, you mentioned, you know, um, free, uh, the, the free, all, but like, well, what about the structure of that? Would you say, David, hey, here's your free blah, 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 you know, keyword you know, what it's about? Or would it be like free for you, David? Like what would you suggest on like the structure of that? Ah, so that's that's a great question. I, in, in that particular case, I would say definitely test because you would want to see whether the person's name is going to pull in more opens than leading with the word free because we know that both of these are powerful. Personalization is very um, effective, but we also know the word free can be very effective. So uh, in, in a case like that, I would, I would test to see which one I led with, which one I put in the number one position. If you, you know, absolutely forced me to say, you know, put your money down on one, put your chip down on one number, what's it going to be? I would probably go with the name before I went with free. But again, it's, you know, what I would really it's want to do is testing. test. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, but um, but what you would want to test is still you'd want to have the personalization and one of the iMagnet words towards the beginning of the subject line, and then go. You wouldn't want to put those in the middle or the end, most like I most to, likely. Most likely, I try to get them as, as close to the front as possible, just because the, you know you put it at the end, and there's a there is the possibility that it's going to get cut off and it's not going to show mm -hmm. up, and and then it it loses obviously any chance of being effective. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, well, very cool, very cool. That that I mean that shoot that one pointer alone will help people. But let's let's give them some more. So I, I've um, heard you talk about the five W's plus one H. Can you explain further what that's all about? Sure, sure. You know what? That's a it's a term that anyone who might have gone to journalism school would probably recognize right away, and and uh, that's where uh, where I first encountered it. But it refers to um, who, what, where, when, why, and how. Those are the, the five W's and the one H, who, what, where, when, why, and how. And in journalism school, they would teach us to write our news stories answering those questions because those are the things that people want to know. And if people want those answers and you include those answers, you'll get them to read your news story. So they always talk about leading with the five W's and the one H. Make sure that you always answer those questions. And where this lines up nicely with um, marketing psychology is that um, there's a, a neuroeconomist named George Lowenstein, and he coined a phrase called information gap theory. And what he found was if there's a gap between what you know and what you want to know, you will take action to close that gap. And so we're in marketing, and 
you know, very often we want people to take action, whether the action is opening the email or responding to the email. Um, we want some kind of an action. And so if we can tee up this notion that there's a gap between what someone knows and what they want to know, we can prompt the action. So using huh? words like who or why or what or how, you know, trigger that information gap. You want to know the answer to those questions. You want to know how to do this or why this or what this. And so that will prompt you to take the action, you know, opening or, or reading or responding. So okay. not only does it work in, uh, in journalism, but it works very well in email marketing. Okay. And, uh, you know, on, on that note of, like, good trigger words, you know, obviously we talked about the five, you know, the eye magnet words for the subject lines. Are, are I mean, are these, like, kind of the trigger words that I've heard about for, like, actually in the – in the first line of the email, or possibly the PS, um, or is that or are these those words, or are there other ones as well that you know help prompt action? Sure, there are, there are definitely other ones. Uh, you know, the you know personalization is good. The word free is good. The whole family of new words is good. But the word you is very very good. Um, if you can't use somebody's name, using the word you is terrific. In fact. There have been some studies that indicate that using the word you instead of the words I, we, our will get you much more engagement. And it, it just kind of makes sense because people don't want to read about what you know the company who's emailing them is all about. They don't want to read about the products or the services. What they want to read about is the you know what it means to them. So when you're skimming and scanning and you see the word you, it's like ah, you know. A lot of times we uh -huh. use the word learn. I always prefer, even though it's longer, I always prefer the word discover. Because learning, well, you know, there's nothing wrong with learning, obviously, but it, it kind of shoots you back to, you know, third grade and Mrs. Green's mm -hmm. class where you're sitting there, you know, staring mm -hmm. at the chalkboard and it's sunny and you want to go outside, but you're stuck in school because you've got to learn, right? But discover, mm -hmm. discover is all about, you know, new, you know, something new, something novel. It goes back to that human need, you know, to, to seek out the new and novel. Uh, the word easy, the word exclusive, the word proven, these are all great. Uh, <laughs> we have a train going by. <laughs> Excellent. No, uh, no, the, it, it just it adds to the realness here. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, so let's see. Uh, so as I was saying, um, the words easy, exclusive, proven, these are all really good trigger words. The word thank you, I just came across a study recently that said that using the word thank you can get you twice as many opens as any other um, approach in a you subject think it line. Using where? Oh, uh, in, in, the, the subject in the subject line? line. In the subject line, yeah. yeah. Some of these other words I just mentioned, you, discover, easy, exclusive, proven, uh, You certainly uh, they'd work in subject lines, but they're also great for the body of email as well. Uh, the particular study I read about regarding thank you indicated uh, it's more of a, uh, it's use in, uh, in the subject line that gets that uh, boost in opening rates. Can you give me an example of where somebody would have used a, a thank you and how, how and they might have done? I'm trying to rack my brain, like, how to do that outside of just, like, hey, thank you for your business and that kind of stuff. Well, can you, do, you, do you know any off the top of your head, like, a, you know, an example that's not a, hey, thank you for your business? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would imagine that's, that's a great way to use it, of course, but if you're doing, you know, something other than thanking them for your business, if perhaps you're trying to get the business, uh, how would you do this? But, you know, you might structure it like, uh, you know, thank you in advance or mm -hmm. thank you for what you're about to do or, um, or, or maybe just the words thank you. And then, you know, that might be enough to get somebody curious enough to open it up to find out what they're being thanked for. And uh, then, the, you know, the letter, or the letter, the body of the email would, uh, would then pay it off, you know, with uh, – mm -hmm. You know, uh, thank you for your five minutes. Yeah, and, and, five and in minutes return, or, here, here's a, here's a great tip that you might be in. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you know, yeah. Or, but, because but again, of people it, like you, we've developed a, a product like this. So thank you. You know. Yeah. Okay. We okay. No. 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 That, that's like wonderful. That. That's wonderful. That's a great. That's a great pointer. Yeah. And again, as you mentioned earlier, it comes down to you know testing, tracking. There's no way you can speak of what's going to work for every single industry and every single marketplace. It's impossible. That's why there's multiple uh, eye magnet words and ultimate trigger. I mean, uh, you know multiple trigger words so okay um very cool man this is this is as fun as i thought it would be okay cool let's um let's move on to some other behavioral principles i i've um heard you speak on and, and talk about a bit we got the scarcity principle the availability bias and social proof uh or those three the availability bias and social proof can you speak a bit uh on each of these you know what they are and then you know how to use them in in real life Oh, absolutely. Yeah, those are three good ones, as a matter of fact. Um, so well, why don't we start with scarcity? That was the first one you mentioned. And um, yes, I guess in a, 
in a nutshell, um, I would explain scarcity by saying we want what we cannot have. We have humans are very, very funny that way, but also very predictable. We have a tendency to want what we can't have. So if something is in scarce supply, we place greater value on it, and it makes us want it more. So if something is readily available, you know, we may or may not want it. We, we want it. We take advantage of it. We don't. We, we don't. You know, we just avoid it. But then you just say to somebody, oh, that thing is only going to be available to a certain group of people or only going to be available for a certain amount of time, and it's, it's amazing. It's like a switch flips in us, and it makes us want it and want it badly. And those are the, the two sides of scarcity, urgency and exclusivity. And they can drive about a 22% increase in open rates, according to the Email Institute. So when you're talking about using urgency, uh, you can have flash sales. You can use the words last chance in your subject line. You can include expiration dates in your, in your email. Uh, you can even use a countdown clock in your email. Uh, World Data says you can get a 17% increase in click-through rates if you have a countdown clock. So that's all on the urgency side of things. On the exclusivity side, uh, you can have VIP customer messages, special offers for, for new customers. You can have email-only offers, which actually deliver a 14% increase in open rates, according to World Data. So the idea with scarcity is either make people feel special or make them feel time-pressed, the exclusivity and the urgency. Okay. And then I think you mentioned availability bias. Yeah, yes. And, um, that, that's an interesting one. Essentially what social scientists have found is if something can be recalled or imagined, we feel as people then it's more likely to, to happen. So it, it's all kind of based on what's in our relevant you know, mindset. If, if we can recall an instance or an example, if, if it's kind of entered into our universe, then we think it's, you know, it's more likely to happen. And in this particular case for email marketers, the it's would be um, – you know, my need for your product. If I can think of a time in the past when I could have used it or if I can imagine a time in the future where it would fit into my life, uh, then it seems like it's more likely I should buy it. So I've seen this used a few different times as well as having you know, used it myself. But once when I saw it used for, you know, on me, uh, I thought it was really interesting. I had gotten an email from Sharper Image, and they were trying to get me to buy an emergency hand crank radio. And I'm just not a hand crank radio kind of gal. You don't know me that well, Dave, but take my word for it, right? Um, <laughs> I think that, uh, you know, electricity is around for a reason. So normally I, I wouldn't have given the email a second thought. But the night before, I was watching the 11 o'clock news before I went to sleep, and the news was filled with stories about um, this storm that was sweeping through the area and all the various neighborhoods that were without power. So I woke up the next morning, and fortunately we did have power, and I checked my emails, and there's this email for this emergency hand crank radio. And suddenly I thought to myself, hmm, you know, maybe I should have one of these, you know, like suddenly I could see the need for it, you know. And then mm -hmm. I've actually used the technique. We, we did some work with the Boston Globe, and we were trying to get people to buy Boston Globe subscriptions as gifts. And we created an email that said a Boston Globe subscription is perfect for your, and then we listed a bunch of descriptors, your theater buff, your sports fan, your political junkie, your crossword puzzle you know, uh, guru, whatever, you know, listed a bunch of those. And so it would have the effect, you know, if somebody's reading this, of thinking, oh, that's my, my husband, that's my son-in-law, that's my daughter, that's my mother. You know, they start to slot in, you know, who's the travel buff in the family, who's the crossword puzzle aficionado, who's the, you know, the travel buff. And suddenly you've got, you know, all of these different potential people you should be buying it for. So availability bias can be pretty powerful when, when used in email marketing. And then okay. uh, I think the last no, no, but before, before we move on to social sure. proof, I just want to touch on something. It just is funny, the timing of this. I, I literally made a note for myself on this one marketplace that we're going to be, you know, going after. And, uh, and it was actually from talking to um, a friend of mine last night that uh, he's not in marketing, but he's a super smart guy, and but he, he's a, he's a – a prosecuting attorney, and and we were talking about it, and we were going to be looking to market to this this uh, one second. It's going to be, hey, imagine this, right? And that's just that's just crazy that you're talking about that today. So that 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 really does, you know, strike. That is a site. That's one of the psychological kind of words to use for something like that. You kind of get people to to start, you know, that. that would that do something to their brain to get them to start thinking of a, you know, a possibility of them either this, you know, type of marketing working for them or working with you or whatever, so that that falls under the availability bias, huh? Yeah, no, that that's an excellent word to use, as a matter of fact. But yeah, get you to to uh, to, you know, project yourself in in this case, you know, imagine it. You're maybe thinking about in the future, but you're kind of creating that scenario where. Um, 
you know, where you'd be very receptive to the message. It, it huh. actually works. That's well. really that's really weird timing. I literally made that note this morning. <laughs> I was going to be working on those scripts over the weekend, and it was imagine this scenario happening. Crazy. All right, uh, moving on. Social proof. So, so social proof. Um, so, in, in a nutshell, we do what other people do, especially if they're like us. So, if if we're not sure what to do. We look around and we basically follow the lead of other people, and this is particularly true if the people that we're watching are, are similar to us in, in some way, shape, or form. So the way we see social proof manifest in email marketing is, you know, or, or marketing in general even, is, you know, most popular product or a bestseller or saying that something is back in stock because you think, oh, my gosh, it was, it was sold out to begin with. It must be popular. We talk about the number of others who have done something. Testimonials, if you're an email marketer, you know, terrific way of using social proof. But there's something interesting about testimonials, and that is a, a good one will say, you know, I love this product, you should get it too, right? That's the gist of it. But a great one will start someplace else. A great one will start with, I wasn't sure that this was going to be a better solution than what I'm currently doing, but then I tried it. Oh, my gosh, I love this product, and you should too. But if you can start where the reader of the testimonial is going to be, which is basically a place of skepticism, is it really any different than what I'm currently using? Is it going to be worth the extra money? Is it going to be worth the time and effort to change? You know, Should I really believe what the marketer is saying? If you can get somebody else to start there and say, I was wondering about this, but then I gave it a try. Oh, my gosh, it's good. That takes a, you know, that becomes a great test testimonial as opposed to just uh, a good one. And there's, you know, if you can get a good one, that's terrific too. But if you can get someone to start with that, hmm, and then move them on. Same thing with, um, with reviews, you know, like showing stars, which is another great way of using social proof. You know, you think, oh, wow, this got, you know, three stars, five stars. You know, that gives me a sense for how popular it is. Northwestern University did a study, and what they found was a a 4.2 to 4.5 star review is better than a straight five star review because having that, you know, if, if you get nothing but five stars, people begin to wonder, mm, you know, can I really believe this marketer? They really got all these five star reviews. 4.2 to 4.5, Northwestern University found was a sweet spot because it helps establish <laughs> trust credibility. Isn't that cool? How do you how do you make that happen if you're if you're doing a great job and you know if you're asking people to leave your reviews or whatever <laughs> you know so, well, hey, if you, you don't know, mind. I mean, you can't yeah you can't uh, you can't you know um, <laughs> tell people what to write but you know some I think what happens is some marketers are tempted to try to to remove the the less than. Uh, oh, perfect one. I'm, you know? I'm big against that. No, I'll tell you right now, I'm huge against that. As long as you have enough good ones, right? I, I, because my wife was, um, she works with this nonprofit, and you know, every now and then they get, you know, crazy. You know, just crazy. You know, they do health care, um, pet care services. So, you know, you're going to have some bad reviews. You ain't going to have some crazy people. And I told her, absolutely, positively, do not remove that. Respond to it. But look at all these other good ones. This, All this does is add legitimacy to the other ones. You know, it's like whatever you do, do not remove that. But respond to it, you know, and tell them. But, yeah, you're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah, address it, but but leave it there. That It, you know, just seems like it's more balanced and it's, it becomes right? more believable. You're absolutely okay. right. Yeah, that was just a feeling I had, but I didn't, I didn't really know it was, um, you know, a, a psychological type of thing. It just was what felt right. I was like, no, no, this just adds legitimacy to all the other ones. Now, if you had nine, you know, all bad ones, well, you better work on your company. <laughs> you exactly, know, you yeah. Work, you know, yeah. And that's always gets, that's always gets forgotten, right, uh, when you're talking about marketing and sales and everything. You, you, not enough is paid attention to, like, well, you've got to have a good product. <laughs> you got to do a good service. But, um, well, cool. Well, that, that, is, that is awesome. Now, on social proof, um, the stars, the testimonial, uh, in the body of the email, below the, the uh, signature, uh, wh where do you suggest placing those? Uh, you know, that's the kind of thing where, you know, well, A, you know, certainly test. Um, but I, I see a testimonial as being a nice supporting uh, piece of information. So uh, obviously you're not going to be able to, well, I shouldn't say obviously. It's hard to be able to fit it into a subject line, although you might be able to if it's, you know, if it's a very short one, you know, uh, best pick according to could be a, a subject line, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I could see uh, using it as a support point. So maybe you, you have your opening gambit, which is whatever product or service it is that you're offering, and then you immediately um, support it with here's what somebody said about it. So you catch somebody's attention when you when you talk about what it is that you're offering and then their first thought is going to be, hmm, 
you know, I wonder if this is for me. I wonder if uh, I should give it a try. And then right away, there you are with that testimonial. Another thing you can do, though, is, is use it along your uh, your footer, your anchor, as just kind of a, an ancillary piece of information, kind of a nice to have, that little extra icing on the on the cake if you want. So it's the kind of thing that I think you can experiment with depending on how you're structuring your message. And, and you know, like many things in email, certainly worth testing a, a few different uh, approaches. Okay. What about a link to, like, your Google reviews? Yeah, you can definitely have it on a landing page or on your on your website. But, but, a link, but like a hyperlink, because sometimes hyperlinks scare people, you know. Um, I know they scare me, you know, if I'm not exactly sure who, who um, you know, you know, even though if it's a company I – know and trust, like Bank of America, you know, I still kind of get freaked out by clicking on anything sometimes. Is that, is that, you know, what other, you know, what data has shown for other people or is it just, you know, my own neuroses? <laughs> well, well, you know, you actually, you, you raise a good point about um, competing calls to action actually too. So if you have an email, you generally want like a single call to action and including uh, a link that says, well, here, come here and, and check our testimonials might actually dissuade them from doing what you want them to do to begin with. You know, maybe the bank wants you to, I don't know, open an, an account or something. If that's the primary uh, call to action and someone's thinking, okay, I'm going to, and then they're like, oh, well, wait, maybe I'll first check this link over here about testimonials. That might actually, you know, take their eye off the ball. So that's a, maybe another reason not to, uh, uh, not to have a link to it. But perhaps when you get somebody to the landing page to open the account or to buy the product or, or whatever, that could be a good place to uh, to uh, reinforce their decision, maybe have some of the testimonials there. Okay. Okay, very cool. Now, this is kind of along the same lines, you know, building authority. You know, how can a marketer do this? I mean, is it through testimonials or whatever? But to create a 33 email if they don't have a big name already, you know, that, that they're tied to. Sure, sure. I mean, if you if you have a, a big name, if you've got a celebrity, you know, more power to you. That's great. Definitely use it. But there are there are other ways to um, to suggest authority. Uh, certainly, you can talk about um, if you've been featured in a particular magazine or on a news program. That's a way to do it. Maybe you're a member of a of a professional association, a trade association, the Better Business Bureau. Um, maybe you have product reviews, you know, if they're from a, a professional reviewer, great, but even from a user. The thing about authority is it's, um, it's almost like it's in the eye of the beholder. It's kind of who we perceive to be authorities. So, for example, if, if somebody switched from a competitor product to yours, um, that, that person could be considered a, an authority in a prospect's eyes, you know, like, oh, there's someone who, who did the, you know, made the move that I'm considering making, and this is what they have to say. They're, you know, they're an authority in this particular uh, area because they've compared both products and made their decision. So there, there are a lot of different ways to use it. The other thing you could think you could consider doing is trying to become an authority yourself, you know, by publishing content or mm -hmm. by citing, you know, your years in business or the awards that you've won or uh, companies that you do business with. That's another, you know, uh, okay. another sign of, uh, you know, what what makes you good. So there are a few different ways to tap into that principle. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, you were mentioning quite a few different things. Is this something else you've written about in the past by chance? Because it seems like that could go pretty deep. And, you know, I always try to look at things from a small business and a large business, you know, because it's, there's different. There's just a difference between trying to sell with a big name and trying to sell without one. So creating this authority can go a long way. Have you uh, – I know there's probably other resources, but I'd like to direct people to you. I, I think you're at the top of the – uh, top of the food chain with all this stuff. So, well, I yeah, have you written you're about the best. that? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you mean you, you I mean you, your credentials speak for themselves. But have you written uh, about the authority principle at all, or authority on email marketing, building well, I think authority? I've touched on it. Uh, I've touched on it here and there. And um, yeah, I work right. at, at Wild Agency, and that's well, Wild with an E, W I L D E. And we have mm -hmm. a, a terrific blog. So if I haven't written about it, uh, likely somebody else in our agency has. So if there's, you know, if there's okay. something that somebody's looking about on any of these principles, you know, definitely check out our, our website and our blog because we're constantly putting out uh, more content that uh, has to do with uh, social science and behavioral economics in marketing. So cool. All right. Now, what about the consistency principle? That, that intrigues me a ton. Uh, can you explain what it is first and then why it's important to keep in mind? Yeah, this is it's like a wonderful little secret weapon for uh, for email marketers. And uh, the consistency principle holds that uh, once somebody makes a decision or takes a stand, 
we like to be consistent in our future actions without giving it much thought. This is what social scientists have found. They've done a, you know, a lot of research into this. And it's like once we make a decision once, we really don't want to go back and revisit that decision you know, from square one. What happens instead is, again, as a way to conserve mental energy, we're like, uh, we just kind of kick into that autopilot mode. Oh, yeah, I've done business with them before. Oh, yes, I, I said yes to them before. So if you can get someone to make, you know, to give you that first small yes, you're much more likely to get the second yes, the third yes, the fourth yes, and you can start to increase or escalate your asks. So you just have to, you have to be a little patient, but go for that first small yes. And that could be something very simple. Like instead of right away hitting people up and saying, hey, I want you to buy the product, maybe you offer a, a starter pack or a free trial, or maybe you even walk it back and just, you know, for that first small yes, get them to download some information or like you on Facebook or answer a, a question or a, a poll or a survey or register for some kind of a, a promotion. But you get that first yes, and then the next time you come back to them, they're not looking at you as, uh, you know, as a, as a brand new potential uh, company to do business with. They're like, oh, yeah, I already said yes to those people. And, you know, you might want to even remind them that they said yes. So here's a, here's a great way to use thank you, as a matter of fact. You know, thank you for taking our survey. It could be the subject line. And then they open it up, and uh, the email asks them to do the next thing. Maybe now it's download some information. You know, you start to escalate those asks. You tie but, all that uh, together. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, if you get, I love it. If you get that first small yes, it, it, uh, it really increases your chances of getting the second, third, and fourth yeses. So, so for instance, if somebody has like a product demo or whatever, you would suggest hey, maybe possibly don't ask for a demo. Maybe ask for, um, can I have five minutes to tell you quickly what we do, and you can decide if you want to do a demo or not. Would you? Would that be kind of an example of it? Versus, hey, I'm so and so. Here's our here's our information. Do you want to set up a demo here? Set a time to talk type of, or to do the demo. That always turns me off personally. I'm like, whoa, 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 take it easy. <laughs> you know, uh, is that would that be along the lines, or do you think like asking for five minutes is more than asking for like a demo? Well, I no, no. I think I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think the you need to think about where somebody is in the um, in the buying cycle and if they're at the very, very beginning, they're probably not ready for a demo. That's a little bit more of a time commitment. It's, you know, and it's asking someone for a, a commitment when they might not even be sure they want to do business with you or they might not be convinced that your product is the right product for them. So, you know, asking them for five minutes versus a demo, definitely easier. But there might even be something in front of the five minutes. Maybe it's asking them to download a, you know, a, a quick cheat sheet about, uh, about the new product or about how, the, how about how people are using this particular new product or new service, you know. So you start with that really small commitment, and it's like, okay, they downloaded the cheat sheet to find out how other people gotcha. in their industry are using this new thing. And then maybe the next thing is how about a five-minute, you know, quickie conversation, and then maybe after that the next thing becomes the demo. You know, you start to escalate that way. Okay. Yeah, that that's – yeah. I, yeah, you, you had a better example. That, that's perfect. And, and that's where content marketing comes in. You know, you have some good content to share and – and breadcrumb them along the way until you ask them. Okay, no, I, I got it, and ho hopefully others do too. Uh, pain, pain or pleasure? Uh, which do you suggest is the most powerful motivator between the two messages? And how, I mean, I, and how can you decide which is the best message for your product or service? And I, I assume what you're, what you're going to say on the second one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. So, well, it, so pain or pleasure is an interesting question, and the. Um, so I'm going to come down on the side of, of a qualified pain, and, and here is the reason why. This is kind of counterintuitive for us as marketers. In marketing, we're all about benefits, all about the wonderful things that are going to happen if you do what I want you to do, right? If you buy my product, if you buy my service, you know, it's, all this great stuff is going to happen. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, and I, I never want to be, you know, um, thought of as the person who said walk away from benefits because that's not the case at all. Benefits are very important. But here's the thing. Social scientists have found that people are twice as motivated to avoid pain as they are to achieve pleasure. So if people are twice as motivated to avoid pain, you want to inject a little bit of that into your, your email marketing. And it could be very simple. You could say, instead of saying, you know, take advantage of, maybe you say, don't miss. You know, those two little words, don't miss, are just enough to trigger that notion of, uh, of loss aversion, which is what uh, this idea of avoiding pain is all about. Um, or maybe, you know, you could you could say something like, um, how about a subject line that says, seven emails you should always send. So you think, well, that, that's something I want to read. I should open up this email and find out because we all want to know which emails we should send. But the flip side of that, with a little bit of the of the pain, if you will, is seven emails you should never send. And right away it's like, oh, I definitely want to know the seven I should never send because we, we want to avoid mistakes. We want to avoid loss. We want to avoid pain. So mm -hmm. the idea is 
have a healthy mix of the two, like never walk away from the benefits because everybody is interested in what's in it for them and, and what they're going to gain. There's, there's no question about that. But what you might want to do is think about, you know, positioning your marketing message in terms of what people will miss if they don't do what you're asking them to do. So what they're going to miss out on if, if they don't say yes to you. Or you say, you know, what, what horrible, nasty thing they can avoid if they do say yes to you. You know, maybe you have the solution to some awful, nasty problem, some pain that they want to avoid. But, but a little bit of that, you know, avoiding pain, introducing that, that pain element can go a long way in, in email marketing. And it, again, it, it's sometimes counterintuitive. I, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to clients and they're set, you know, they'll say, I really like that line or I really like that concept, but uh, can, you, can you twist it a little bit, make it a little bit more positive? It's just a little too negative. And uh, you know, I have to come back and explain, actually, that's what's going to make it work even better. You know, people are twice as motivated to avoid the pain as they are to achieve the gain. So sometimes leading with that avoidance is even better than leading with the gain. Yeah, or you can just take every email that you do that's a pain or pleasure one and just vice versa it and come up with uh, the, the opposite. You know, like you were mentioning, seven emails that will go the other direction. Just start looking at what you've done, and that immediately can give you some good opportunities to try out their email or content or whatever. You know, just go the other direction with it and see what happens. Um, yeah, that's a great awesome. Idea. Yep. Awesome. Now, um, overall, man, we're running a little bit out of time. I have so many other questions, so I'm going to try to pick the one I think is going to be the most helpful here. Um, overall layout of your emails, just the overall. We, we've talked about, you've talked about um, some parameters on the subject lines, and um, but can you can you give your advice here, just some bullet points basically of um, – uh, I think I've, I've heard you talk about in the past, can, can just the overall layout. Can, can you give some pointers there? Yeah. You know, these days we recommend mobile first, single column. It's it's going to be the, you know, the most user-friendly for people. Keep things short and scannable. People read 25% slower online, and it's even harder when they're reading on mobile phones. And these days, you know, half, you know, half, people, half of the people uh, that are reading their emails are doing it on, on a mobile phone. Strategically use visuals. Never have your key message in nothing but the visual because so many people have images off. But on the other hand, people love visuals, so have the visuals there. Always have an alt tag just in case they don't load, and make sure your key information is also in the text. Uh, buttons, your call to action, make sure your button is a contrasting color. Uh, make sure that the copy on it is benefit-oriented. Make sure there's enough white space around it, uh, particularly because so many people are looking at things on phones. You don't want them to fat finger and you know hit the, hit the wrong link, so put enough space around your links and your buttons. Have a single call to action, so one thing you want people to do, but then repeat your request for them to do it two or three times. And um, stick to one or two typefaces. Anything more than two typefaces can actually decrease your click-through rate. So it, it just starts to look too busy and too crowded. Yeah. So those Hate are my those. kind of top tips for layout. You, and you mentioned, and, and, the, and these I've stolen from you, so these are still, these are your words, but you mentioned um, uh, the call to actions, especially for mobile. I think you mentioned they need to be 15 pixels to combat fat fingering, you know, um, yes, with, with yeah. mobile phones. And another thing you mentioned that I'd like for you um, to talk about, I have it written down here, but I, I need you to explain it, is you said people read in an F pattern, so use a contrasting color for buttons. Like, what do you mean by that, F pattern, and, and so what does that do to your layout? They've, they've done a lot of different eye tracking studies, and they what they find is the upper left uh, kind of corner of your email is – here, at least in, in the States and in other places where people read left to right, that's where people go first. So that's a real hot spot. That's a very important um, part of, of an email's real estate because that's where people are going to start. That's where they're going to look. And then typically, they've done a lot of eye tracking studies. What happens is people will then go all the way across, and then they kind of also look right down. They look down the left margin. So that starts to give you the F, if you will. Um, They'll, you know, they'll come in at the top left. They'll go all the way across. They'll also start at that t top left and, and run down. So you're starting to get that F. Um, sometimes uh, eye tracking will say either go with an F or a Z because sometimes they'll start the up upper left, go all the way across to the right, and then kind of diagonal back down towards the lower left and then scoot across the bottom again. So that F pattern or that Z pattern uh, begins to show you where people look most when they're looking at an email. So those are kind of the, the hot spots, if you will. Mm -hmm. And, and w with, like, getting some key points, do you like bullet points in emails? 
Yeah, anything to keep a, a, a email short and scannable. So bullet mm -hmm. points, crossheads, very short copy, a powerful headline. People are you know, more likely to read the, the headline than they are to, to read the body copy to begin with. So uh, a powerful headline, bullets, short copy, short paragraphs, um, always focus on um, personalized relevant content, you know, what's in it for the, the reader as opposed to what it is you want to say and uh, you're, you're going to be in a much better spot. And then, you know, this isn't really design. It's more like construction of an email, but avoiding jargon and marketing speak and just trying to, uh, to have a fresh voice and, and sound friendly and accessible and, uh, and easy to digest. Gotcha. And what about the PS? What about that real estate? What do you, you suggest that to be a thank you for your time? Do you suggest that to be where you put a testimonial? Is that where you put the call to action? What's your best uses for the PS in your mind? Um, yeah, so uh, it's interesting with uh, with a letter. If we were in in the offline world, I would say, oh, you know, recap the offer or add a little bit of information that you haven't gotten to in the body of the letter. I'm not such a big fan of that when it comes to email, and um, I think the the reason is uh, people are reading so quickly and they're much more focused on um, you know the top of the email. So I wouldn't hold any new information for the PS, but it is a good place maybe to. Um, to put some of the credibility markers, to offer some uh, some reassurances. Maybe you have some social share buttons, which are, you know, I'm a fan of social share. They're a little bit different than the follow us buttons because what I want people to do is take action on the email, and then if they want to share it, that's great, as opposed to taking off to follow me on LinkedIn and then never coming back to the email to do what I want you to do. We do a lot of work with certain regulated industries, finance and insurance. So the bottom is a, of the email is a good place for the, you know, the inevitable legal and disclaimers. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, so I have a tendency to to put the most important information up towards the top and then reserve the the bottom for the, the things like the security badges, the seals, the social share, and the and the legal and disclaimers. Okay, very cool. All right, uh, to conclude. If you had to give the very top thing a marketer you can say in their emails to increase response, I know we've been given a lot of pointers and you don't just want them to do one thing, but if you had to say, okay, just take this one thing, do this one thing, and it will help increase your response, what would you say? Give them the reason why you're asking them to do what you want them to do. There have been a, a number of different uh, social scientists who have studied this, and what they found is people are more likely to do what you ask them to do if you give them the reason why. So, you know, you might have a great product at a great price, and you might think as a marketer, well, you know, it's obvious why they should buy this, but uh, close the loop for people and just provide that reason why, you know, because this is going to help you, because you're going to be among the first to enjoy this. Whatever it turns out to be, give that reason why, because it's just one of those things that, um, you know, people default to. With the reason why, they're, they're that much more likely to do what you're asking them to do. It's that decision-making shortcut that people rely on. So if we know it as an email marketer, we might as well use it. All right. And you mentioned it a couple times in saying that, but I think the word because is uh, was strategic and why you're – I think it's just so ingrained in you to use that word. I, I've read about that a long time ago as well. That that alone is in conjunction with the why is a super powerful word. Is that is that correct in your mind as well? Uh, Dave, you're absolutely right about that. It's, it's what's known as a compliance trigger. The word because is a compliance trigger. When we see it or hear it, we just automatically start to comply or, or nod yes without fully processing what comes after it. It's very, mm -hmm. very interesting. We just we get to the word because and we just figure whatever comes next is going to be a good, legitimate reason, and mm -hmm. so we just start to say yes. And uh, there are other yep. ways, of, obviously, to explain the reason why, but because is like a magic way to do it. Yeah, it, isn't it? That, that's probably – all the psychological stuff I've read about, that one just has stuck out to me the most. Like, that is incredibly fascinating. They've even, I think I even read a study where people tried to cut in line for the water line or whatever <laughs> to get a drink of water, and they, if they just used because, it was no problem. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it, yeah, it, it, it is. It's, it's the neatest thing. It's, it's well, there's a, Nancy, no, it's a, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yep. I, was, no, I, I was, think it was a, there was a study that a woman from Harvard named Ellen Langer did, and it had to do with people lined up to use a, a photocopier. And, uh, yeah, and she, that's what it was. That's what it, yeah, it's really fascinating stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah, hey, i got to use this because I'm running late to a meeting. Okay, go ahead, right? It's, it's, it's crazy. But that, that right there, that one pointer right there, give the reason why, utilize that because, and the because makes it easier for everybody to actually – state the reason why as well. So it's actually kind of a, a win-win there. Awesome. Nancy, this uh, 
this met every expectation I had for it, and I had very high expectations for this. I, I, when I was putting these questions together, I was like, yeah, I need to know about that. Yeah, I need to know about that. And you explained everything so wonderfully. I, I greatly appreciate your time. Um, how can people continue to learn from you? So, um, well, well, first of all, thank you very much, Dave. I totally appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and, and to, uh, to talk about the psychology behind email marketing. So it's one of my favorite topics. So thank you very much for, uh, for spending this time with me. Um, people are welcome to um, follow me on Twitter, at nharhut, N-H-A-R-H-U-T, or on LinkedIn, or they can check me out at Wild Agency's blog. Wild is W-I-L-D-E. And if they happen to be following any of the um, marketing conferences, I'll be speaking at South by Southwest in March, the Content Marketing Conference in April, Conversion Conference in April, Financial Brands Forum in May. Those are just the first few. So um, wow. I pop up here and there if people are following yeah. uh, marketing conferences. Uh, if, anyone, if anyone out there happens to see me, please come by and say hello. I'd love to meet them. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Nancy. I really appreciate it. And uh, until next time.